Here's a question. Have you ever dreamed of what it would be like to play professional tennis on the world's biggest stages, yet possess virtually 0% of the talent, fitness, or dedication required, instead spending your days mindlessly scrolling through YouTube watching somebody else talk about it? Well, amazingly, from 2010 to 2016, the US Open, yes, that US Open, gave anybody interested the chance to actually play and compete in one of the world's biggest tennis tournaments. No experience required. So, what was the catch? While this wasn't any type of giveaway or lottery, this was the US Open National Playoffs, a nationwide tournament anyone could sign up for that granted the winner a prized wildcard spot into the US Open qualifying draw. If by some miraculous chance that lucky contender managed to win three qualifying matches, they potentially set themselves up for a first-round professional debut against Novak Djokovic on Arthur Ashe Stadium in front of millions of television viewers. Feeling lucky? Let's break down what it took to win such a crazy tournament, how the actual winners fared, and why despite such initial fanfare and hype, parent organization USTA decided to ultimately scrap the entire event when loopholes in its rules began being exploited. Forget all that lifelong training and sacrifice nonsense, you've just won a golden ticket to the very top with the US Open National Playoffs. Now as you could imagine, the path a tennis professional normally takes in order to directly qualify for the US Open, one of the four Grand Slam tournaments that headline the annual tennis season, is arduous, at best. After many years of playing ITF and challenger level events, tennis's equivalent of AA and AAA minor league, a player may have accumulated enough ranking points to move up into small professional events. With enough talent and success at this level, their wins will have earned them just enough ranking points to squeeze into the top 250 in rankings. It's here that the player may then be invited to play in the US Open qualifiers, the 128-person tournament which grants direct US Open entry to players who make it to the final 16, a dream come true for aspiring tennis pros. Now, this process is a lot in terms of time, effort, and financial resources required in devotion of a dream. Just imagine if there was a way to skip the first two steps and jump right into the qualifying rounds. Wouldn't that be something? Well, the USTA thought so too. In early 2010, the United States Tennis Association, or USTA, announced the launch of the US Open National Playoffs, providing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for anyone 14 years of age and older the chance to earn a wild card into the 2010 US Open qualifiers. Here's how it worked. To accommodate those around the country, the US Open National Playoffs began with 16 men's and women's sectional qualifying tournaments held throughout the United States from April to June. There was no seeding allowed, and individual sectional qualifying draws could host up to 256 entrants. The men's and women's champions from each of the sectional qualifying tournaments, 16 in total, would then advance to the US Open National Playoffs, men's and women's championships, hosted at a major tennis stadium and broadcast live on the tennis channel. From here, the ultimate winner of both the men's and women's playoffs would be granted a wild card into that year's US Open qualifying draw, where they could, theoretically, win their way into the main draw. While pre-qualifying draws are not a new concept, with many professional tournaments around the world giving some of their lowest ranked countrymen the opportunity to fight their way into qualifying, the US Open national playoffs were unique in that you needed no ranking, no history, frankly, no verifiable tennis ability to sign up and live your dream. Though clearly a marketing ploy by the USTA to expand tennis's diminishing reach to American audiences, the event nonetheless became a nationwide phenomenon. Over 1,200 participants from all walks of life, professional poker players, chemistry professors, middle school children, CEOs, music composers, news anchors, and many, many more beginners, hobbyists, and advanced players took part in the inaugural event. Alongside an array of celebrities who in following years took part, including Olympic skier Bode Miller, LMFAO frontman Red Fu, and even former great Chris Everett herself. The event's initial success even gave way for the addition of regular and mixed doubles brackets in later years, giving participants every possible chance to play into their strengths. Though seemingly expertly executed and well off, the USTA surprisingly announced in early 2017, however, that they were abandoning the concept of national playoffs after just seven seasons, citing that the mission of the nationwide tournament was, quote, not being fulfilled. What exactly did they mean by this? Well, upon a closer retrospective examination of past winners, it's fairly easy to see how the tournament's rules and methods were not only entirely flawed from the beginning, but worse yet, how the USTA could have but chose not to address and fix them, choosing rather to abandon the tournament altogether. When the dust settled following the events of the inaugural 2010 season, the men's singles champion who received the fabled wildcard was 23-year-old Blake Strode. 
Though most keeping up were initially excited to see how an amateur would face off against real professionals in the qualifiers, Blake Strode was not an amateur, but a professional, with a world ranking in the 4 to 500s while participating in the playoffs. The opponent he faced to win the tournament was Cecil Mamit, a former ATP pro with a career-high ranking of 72, who had previously played in all four Grand Slam main draws multiple times. Though not against the rules, players at this level were far, far and above the type of person this tournament was advertised and catered towards. In 2011, the national playoff men's singles champion was Blake Strode, again. In fact, 12 of the 16 men's finalists that year had held professional rankings at one point, and all had at least some previous professional tournament experience, revealing exactly the quality of player who actually had a shot of making a deep run in the tournament. The same phenomena was witnessed every single year in virtually every bracket. All finalists who had won their section appeared to be retired top-level professionals, low-level current professionals, or highly talented Division I college players, many times having just recently won the NCAA championships. Although the grand illusion that some amateur could have a fairy tale US Open run was firmly debunked, this at least opened up the possibility that a national playoff champion could actually win the three qualifying matches necessary to make the US Open main draw, right? Not quite. In the event's seven seasons of existence, not one men's or women's singles playoff champion ever made it past the second round of qualifying, with most losing in the first round outright. Although each year's men's, women's, and mixed doubles champions were actually given wild cards straight into their respective main draws due to doubles qualifying not existing at the US Open, not one team ever made it past the first round. Herein lies the predominant issue with how the tournament was structured from inception. Without any type of restrictions on player level, it was formulaically designed to draw in players who might have otherwise had chances to play in the US Open qualifying regardless, but found it easier to simply try their luck doing so through the national playoffs, a tournament designed with amateurs, not professionals in mind. Though many might argue that truly being open to anyone did make it as fair as possible, at what cost? With the same world-class players consistently winning their section year after year, combined with how the playoff champions consistently lost handily in qualifying, the allure that initially drew in participants and spectators, the fantasy that an amateur could magically make their way to the US Open, quickly faded. This itself was evidenced by stagnant participation and muted feedback in later years, leading the USTA to determine that the community initiatives budget earmarked for the national playoffs would instead be redirected to youth and grassroots tennis, concluding that, though the playoffs were introduced as means for all tennis players to have a chance to qualify for the US Open, we have seen from recent competitions that the playoffs are being utilized by pro tennis players as a pathway to the US Open. This was not how the playoffs were originally designed. Therefore, the playoffs are being discontinued. Though a simple rule change banning professionals or those with professional tournament history might have been a quick fix, others may point to the Italian Tennis Federation's ability to annually host over 15,000 participants for its similar Rome Masters pre-qualification tournament, which perhaps signals a deeper issue with how the USTA markets tennis within the United States as a whole. But while you may never have the chance to compete at a Grand Slam like many of your favorite tennis pros, that doesn't mean you can't train, practice, or strategize just like them. In fact, having myself attended the national playoffs in New York City many years ago, the most apparent factor that separated amateur and high-level doubles teams wasn't power, fitness, or even skill. It was strategy and game plan, especially at the net. So if you're the type of player that constantly watches too many poachable balls whiz by, wishing for a step-by-step -step guide that taught you the exact plays that professionals swear by, I highly recommend you check out the Doubles Playbook by Fuzzy Yellow Balls, the sponsor of today's video, because inside there are 48 tried and tested plays from Martina Navratilova and the Bryan Brothers that show you how to set up easy put-away volleys and overheads. Think about it, if you look at other sports, teams run plays. Football teams run plays to score touchdowns, soccer teams run plays to score goals, and basketball teams run plays to score baskets. When it comes to your doubles game, you can and should run routine plays to set up easy put-away volleys and overheads. Now, who doesn't love free? Because by clicking the link in the description of this video, Martina Navratilova will personally show you one of her all-time favorite plays from the doubles playbook called The Prognosticator, a free 15-minute video not found anywhere else, just so you can see if what the doubles playbook offers is right for you. The doubles playbook truly is an amazing resource for any beginner, club level, or advanced tennis player looking to drastically improve their doubles game, win more points at the net, and ultimately move up their club or league ladder. So be sure to check out the link in the description for your free video showing you one of the many plays from the doubles playbook.